We don't need everyone. We need some who are willing to see us as something better than some bad decisions we made. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. Liberty lovers, Liberty fans, Liberty curious, welcome back to the Lions of Liberty podcast. This is episode number 105. Before I get to my guest today, I want to take a quick second to tell you guys about Health Excellence Select. This is a great organization that utilizes the concept of health sharing, where other people voluntarily chip in to cover your medical costs in order to provide you an amazing healthcare package. To learn more, head over to lionsofliberty.com slash health. My guest today is a former stockbroker who served 400 days in federal prison for violating security laws. He is now an author, having written two books, Lessons from Prison and Ethics in Motion, as well as a motivational speaker and a consultant helping white-collar criminals thrive through the prison system, as well as helping prisoners prepare for life after prison. Justin Paperni, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Thank you for having me. Uh, Justin, I'm excited to talk to you about your current work, helping people transition both into and out of prison. But before we get to that, I'd like to learn a little bit more about your story. So why don't you just briefly tell us a bit about yourself and describe the events which led up to your arrest for securities violations. I'd love to. So I grew up in Encino, California, which is a a Jewish enclave about 20 minutes outside of Los Angeles. Uh, As a young man, baseball consumed me, uh, leading me to the University of Southern California, where I was a proud member of the USC baseball team that lost in the 1995 College World Series. Uh, While I played baseball at USC, I knew my skill set wasn't going to go past USC, so I studied hard, getting a degree in psychology, and also spent some summers interning at Goldman Sachs. I had a cousin that worked there. And I love the thrill of money management, hearing $50, $100 million orders going in, and, and it was incredible. I felt like I was playing baseball on that trading floor. So after graduating, I went into the young training program at Merrill Lynch, Uh, obtained my securities license. And three or four years into my career, I was managing north of uh, $40 million, focusing primarily on professional athletes, as a lot of my friends with whom I had played baseball uh, trusted me with their money or a portion of their money. And my senior partner and I began to execute trades for hedge fund managers, which we thought was the real sweet spot in the industry, because the hedge fund manager is out raising money and placing the assets with us further All of the trades were unsolicited, which is beautiful because we essentially had no responsibility for the management of the money. Uh, Six years into my career, a hedge fund manager in Los Angeles, not far from my UBS office in Century City, began to raise a lot of money and he began to lose a lot of money. And then he continued to raise more money and lose all of that money. So our experience in the brokerage business together with degrees from USC and Series 7 and 63, you know, told all of us at UBS that clearly something was afoot, that our client might have been making misrepresentations to investors in order to raise money. And in time, our thoughts or concerns were real when I actually began to attend some meetings and listened firsthand at misrepresentations that he was making. And despite being raised with uh, opportunities for my parents and teaching me right from wrong and being groomed by wonderful college coaches holding me accountable, Several years into my career, I uh, turned the other way at some of these meetings and, in fact, lied on behalf of my client to allow him to continue this fraud uh, with the idea that he would make the money back. And, of course, that was the rationalization. There was no chance he was going to make the money back, and it had turned out to be a classic Ponzi scheme. And as the judge told me at my sentencing, I had aided and abetted a dastardly fraud. And as a result, I went to prison, Taft Federal Prison Camp, seven years ago today, to be exact, to begin serving my 18-month prison sentence. So you were well aware that there was fraud going on, and you did actively help to facilitate that fraud, even though you didn't initially initiate the fraud. Once you became aware of it, you didn't do the right thing, I guess you would say, which was raise the red flag. Instead, you, for, I guess you maybe just saw the money coming in still and thought that there was really no way to get caught and just decide to sort of look the other way or continue to help facilitate it? It wasn't until I got to federal prison through philosophy and ethics and learning that I realized that uh, I, like many white collar offenders, rationalized and excused my conduct away all the way until the time I went to prison. While fighting my case, even while I was trying to accept responsibility, I would blame UBS, my former employer, my former partner, my former 
client for sweeping or bringing me into this mess. It was a way to, to numb the pain. So while initially it was very subtle, I knew about the losses and we began to question how he's continuing to raise money. So we, we were very much on the periphery while collecting large sums of commissions by thinking that because I went to UBS and disclosed the losses, shared my concerns that our client was continuing to lose money, I thought by doing that I had kicked aside any additional responsibility that I had. Of course, I was raised to know right from wrong. I knew that it was wrong to turn the other way while he was raising money and we were collecting commissions. And much like the people that I coach, finally getting away from those rationalizations or excuses, which are frankly ugly and they derail our progress. And as a result, send good educated people to prison for even longer because the government says we don't accept responsibility. If we can get there quicker, our lives, we can begin healing and really begin this lifelong process of seeking redemption, which I'm still on every day. But to your question, certainly I knew that it was wrong. I was raised to know right from wrong. Well, was that a factor in your sentencing then? The fact that maybe the judge didn't see you accepting responsibility, at least at that point? Well, I, I think initially that the government didn't view me as accepting responsibility foolishly. I even lied to the FBI mm. during my interview. And I've done some work with the FBI. I've lectured at the FBI Academy of Quantico, Virginia, helping agents better understand how they can investigate an educated guy like me. We're so afraid to come clean. So certainly in front of the FBI, I lied because I feared how they would view me. And I wanted them to still see me as a, a baseball player from college and a young, successful stockbroker. I didn't want them to see me as someone who creates victims of others. So no doubt, as a result of my line and unwilling to accept responsibility sooner, it's part of the reason that I ended up in prison. And I really fell victim to that cliche that cover-up is worse than the crime. I just couldn't own it, Mark. I didn't want to embarrass my family and read my name all over the, the internet, which of course eventually happened. And by delaying the inevitable, I made matters so much worse for those that love and support me. It sounds like you almost had a cognitive disconnect in a way. I mean, you you did know deep down that what you were doing was wrong and that there was this fraud going on, but you were able to sort of convince yourself that it wasn't really on you or convince yourself that you could just let it go on and on and, until you did finally get caught. Yeah, the irony is, you know, while living in denial that you're making matters worse, but the, those moments of solace that it provides makes it worth it at the time. But you always know that inevitably things will be you know worse off because of it. So let's talk about a little bit of your personal development while you're in prison. I know that you really had a, a transformation there in terms of your own ethics, your own m philosophy. So can you describe some of the philosophers that you read while you were in prison and how that sort of shaped your, your ethics? Well, the first philosopher I proudly met was Michael Santos. Right, of course. Not famous by historical standards. No one in my life besides my parents have influenced me more than Michael. Upon my surrender, he shook my hand. I told him about my experience as a stockbroker let him know that my family had sent me his work. Of course, Michael, for your, your listeners, they should know he'd already been in prison for 22 years when I met him. And I remember telling Michael my second day in prison, I'm so overwhelmed. I've lost my money, embarrassed my name, ruined my career. And you know, how do I ever get back? The task is so big. And I think the first philosophical lesson he taught me was something that he learned along the way. We all learned from someone was that the slow and steady wins the race, the daily incremental pursuit of small goals will eventually lead up to huge accomplishments. So alongside him, every day I began waking early, reading philosophers that he introduced me to, like Aristotle, um, of cultivating character, of becoming better each day. He shared with me the story of the trial of Socrates that early that impacted him heavily while he was sitting in a county jail after his arrest of Socrates drinking the poison in lieu of choosing um, escape. And I began to learn about discipline and integrity and about cliches and platitudes, meaning I used to say things, and, but I didn't follow through and I wasn't a man of integrity. So I began committed to documenting my progress and growth through my writing and then holding myself accountable and assessing if I was actually improving. So in addition to the ancient philosophers of Aristotle and Socrates and, and Plato and Rand had an influence on me, as she does many of the people in prison, uh, none were greater than than Michael Santos. And I could relate to him, even though he was a long-term prisoner through selling, you know, selling drugs, no one had accomplished more. I mean, you look at the record, no one has accomplished more over the last 25 years in federal prison than Michael Santos. And because I was there, I could relate to and learn from him. And frankly, I was in awe and in times now am still in awe of what he's been through. So uh, the greatest philosopher to me was Michael Santos. 
Of course, a past guest on this show, Michael Santos. You can listen to my interview with him in episode number 93, and you can find that full archive at lionsofliberty.com slash podcast. Truly an inspiring man. He spent 26 years in federal prison and came out an amazing man now who's doing a lot of work that uh, is similar to what you're doing, which we'll get to in a moment. But going back to your time in prison, Justin, when you were first arrived in prison, before you had really had this personal transformation, what were you thinking about, I guess, your future? I mean, 18 months was your sentence, but obviously this label of felon is something that was destined to affect you for essentially the rest of your life. So what was actually going through your head? How did you see your future unfolding before you really came up with this plan to rebuild your support network and set up a life for yourself after prison? Well, I knew after I got to prison and that I had adjust by, by adjusting properly, I learned that I shouldn't be concerned about prison, but rather what the rest of my life would look like as a result of my time in prison. And because of that, that awareness, I began adjusting really aggressively and proactively for what life would be like. Because the greatest, the greatest consequence for me, and indeed many of the people who reach out to and hire me, isn't necessarily the time in prison. But that lifelong stigma that accompanies the process of returning home with a, to a sullied reputation, of just the embarrassment that you've brought to your community, and, and employability. As a, as a stockbroker, I lost my licenses. I sold real estate before I went to prison. I lost, I lost that license too. So I wasn't concerned about prison after I adjusted well, but rather, wow, I'm coming home. I'm used to making money, doing something that I love. What does the future hold for me? And th- those, those thoughts convinced me to wake early and work hard. And how did you actually go about rebuilding your reputation, rebuilding your support network, and essentially regaining the trust of family and friends and that kind of thing, the people that you were going to need to be by your side and supporting you when you got out of prison? Well, I knew the stigma that accompanied a federal conviction, and I I wanted to begin to debunk the myth that it was just greed that leads good people to cross the line. I was... Greed was certainly a factor, but there was feelings of entitlement and shallowness and vengeance and getting back at people who I didn't think valued my work. And I wanted to begin to open up about the pressures and motivations that, that consumed me and use them as a teachable asset. And really, my experience through prison was the only asset that I really had left and, and a, a will to, to work hard and succeed. So I knew that a lot of men in prison worked hard, yet nobody knew. I knew that a lot of men drifted in prison and had good and bad days and really never got on track. So I took a page out of Michael Santos's playbook. Thinking differently and against the odds, I began documenting the journey through a blog at justinpaperni.com. I called my mom from prison and said, create a blog. She said, what's that? I said, Ma, <laughs> just create the blog. It doesn't matter. I'm going to send you a page every day until I'm released and just post it on the internet for people to read and learn from my experience. And she did. And within a matter of weeks, I began receiving scores of letters from all over the country, families and soon-to-be prisoners thanking me for providing a glimpse into this unknown world of confinement. And through that giving back, it, it began to really help me as well. My writing skills were improving. My speaking skills were improving as I began to teach a class in prison. But by documenting what I was learning through this process, I felt as if I was authentic. I wasn't saying one thing in doing another. I wasn't talking about wanting to exercise or, or, or reading a hundred books or becoming a man of character. I would say it and then I would document it through my work and any and all could hold me accountable. Till this day, I have uh, prospects who become clients who hire me and they say, I have been up all night reading your blogs and you did it and I can learn from that and you're authentic and real. I want to go down that journey and I remind them it, it's not easy and there, there's no magic pill here like me, like Michael, it requires a deliberateness. And while I have that template, you have to be willing to work as I and and Michael did. And if you do, you can't change everybody, Mark. There are some people who will never forgive. That's part of the consequence of crime. But beautifully, we don't need everyone. We need some who are willing to see us as something better than some bad decisions we made. And Justin, you took those bad decisions you made that landed you in prison and turned them around into a positive for yourself and found ways to improve your life, improve yourself, improve your prospects for life out of prison, just as Michael Santos did as well. But from speaking to you as well as Michael Santos, I I really get the impression that you guys are the exception to the rule and that this is not the path that most prisoners end up taking. So from your viewpoint of a prisoner, from being behind bars, 
What would you say are the biggest problems with the U.S. prison system when it comes to, I guess, fostering an environment where people can at least actively improve themselves and are encouraged to do so? I mean, obviously, it's impossible, as people like you and Michael Santos have proven, but I think we can all see from the recidivism rates that, you know, most people do not end up really improving themselves and setting themselves up for life outside prison. So what are the issues you see within the prison system that might hinder that? Well, certainly some people might be more predisposed to to, want to work than others. Um, In prison, I realized, and I say this not to just totally knock the correction system. There are some benefits that come. And you could argue that the system of corrections worked for me. But speaking on a larger scale, I can tell you that there's just so very very little correcting going on. And I do some work with pretrial services. I've done some work with the FBI. And I'm honest when I tell them I wouldn't call you correctional officers because there's no correcting. So I am convinced the longer we incarcerate people, the less likely they'll succeed upon release. And while there, the educational, the reforms aren't existing. And in fact, you go inside a federal prison where I serve time on the softball field, you'll see a big platitude on the wall that says preparing offenders for reentry. There is no real preparing taking place in prison. I think taxpayers might like to know or should better hold our system of corrections accountable because their tax dollars are being spent, yet prisoners are coming home unprepared. So that's one issue, that the preparing and the programs inside are lacking, in my opinion. And secondly, I mean, look, we're drunk on incarceration. I mean, we lock up so many people, and there's just no measures in place to get released any sooner. You look at Michael's book, Earning Freedom, under the idea that you know, rather than just locking someone up for 10 or 20 or 30 years and just letting calendar pages turn, how about some measure or some performance, um, some objectives that would allow someone to earn release sooner rather than waiting on a law to pass, waiting on legislative reform, incentivizing prisoners to work hard, develop skills and release and not come back through the, you know, the revolving door. So I'm not just blaming the prison system. That's not my style. They have some responsibility. And additionally, the prisoners have a responsibility to use their time more wisely to develop skills that will aid their release. So I'm passionate about prisoner reentry and real cognitive driven programs that help change the way prisoners think while reinforcing the importance of avoiding criminal associations because many of the people who recidivate and go back do so in part because they continue to associate with the wrong people. So we could speak forever about corrections, but two things, the length of sentences are too long and we're not giving incentives for prisoners to, to educate themselves and as a result, come home sooner. Yeah, it seems like the sentencing system is, or the methods that are used to determine sentencing are basically arbitrary. I mean, they're at the discretion of a judge or at the discretion of arbitrary laws that might put certain mandatory minimums in place. But the focus is always on this amount of time, the number of calendar days, and never on you know any kind of actual evidence that someone has been corrected or someone has changed their behavior, changed who they are as a person. And that's something that yourself and Michael Santos both emphasize in um, your criticism of the prison system. Obviously, not every criminal is going to... Some people may never be reformed. Some people may just be psychopathic murderers, and maybe those people should be indefinitely behind bars. But there are other people that might, such as Michael Santos, that have an arbitrary sentence of, say, 26 years. And it's very clear that he even said after eight years, there was no more improving that he could do. He was the person he is now. So it's clearly a problem where there is just no sort of judgment of the person's character as they go through the system. There's simply that ticking of the calendar. And, and the longer that calendar ticks, it seems the less likely that people are going to be set up for success upon re-entry. Uh, that is something that you have dedicated your post-prison life to, however, so there is support out there. So why don't you tell us about what you've done since you left prison in order to help people transition back into society with the Michael G. Santos Foundation? Sure. Thank you. Upon my release, I began to do some consulting to white-collar offenders, began to do some lecturing, but also was so inspired and moved by the way that Michael taught me and hundreds of others or thousands of others through his time in prison that I got permission from my probation officers. I had no money to put on a credit card to pay a lawyer in San Francisco to get permission to create the Michael G. Santos Foundation to honor Michael and the work. And because I knew if others adjusted, you know, 10% as well as him, recidivism would be slashed. So I got permission, created the Michael G. Santos Foundation. We wrote a grant request to the California Wellness Foundation. And in 2010, we received a $140,000 two-year grant that enabled us to develop, implement, and design a reentry program based on Michael's experience, the authenticity. Uh, as Michael likes to say, there's value in reading about Shakespeare and Hemingway. Don't get me wrong. But prisoners are of a little different mindset, and they have to be able to relate to the material. And I'll tell you this. Prisoners relate to Michael Santos and his journey. Besides it being inspiring, 
he had documented it for so long and showed step by step how to get there. So that's what we could teach from. It was so authentic and it resonated with our audience. So we began slowly in some juvenile halls, in some prisons, and we began to have 5, 10, 50, 100, 500, then 1,000 people go through our Straight A Guide program that Michael created. And over the last two years, it's transitioned into a staffing company where through the Michael G. Santos Foundation, we have a staffing component that only hires the formerly incarcerated. Why? Michael and I reached out to employers, and they were reluctant to place the formerly incarcerated on their payroll. They had perceptions of people out of prison, fear they may fake a workers' comp claim or show up. And you know, They said, I'm willing to give you a chance, but I'm not going to take all the risk and put them on the payroll. We said, great. We've trained them. They're ready to go. Test them on our payroll. So through the staffing company that we've created, we temporarily employ people out of prison. And now many are continuing to, to thrive just in one program in Stockton, California, which has been riddled with crime. I think the second highest murder rate behind Chicago or even ahead of Chicago. We had more than 50 formerly incarcerated in uh, Stockton, California. And now some of them are beginning to get converted to, to full-time employees. And we're just, we're just getting going. And all of it started with my shaking Michael Santos's hand in prison, then realizing that me and thousands of others who have been through the system, frankly, which with much worse experiences than me, with few of the opportunities that I ever took for granted, those prisoners and those released from prison could benefit in a massive, massive way. And that's why I created the Michael G. Santos Foundation. I'm proud to run it, and I'm very excited for the next few years will take us. Wow, so you guys actually go out and essentially vouch for these prisoners that you're sending to these companies who are willing to take the chance. They just don't want to be on the hook if something does go wrong. So essentially, you guys are putting yourselves on the hook for these guys until they get to a point where a company is comfortable hiring them directly. So what does a former prisoner have to do to, I guess, prove to you that they're worthy of being vouched for by the Michael G. Santos Foundation? How does that process work? Sure. So much like I and Michael and others collected evidence of their rehabilitation, we work with community-based partners. For example, in, in Stockton, California, we partner with fathers and families. And we had a relationship with Councilman Michael Tubbs, who got his undergraduate and master's degree from Stanford at 23. He's a councilman in Stockton. And we began working with fathers and families to train probationers and those recently released from prison. So while Michael and I are cultivating relationships with employers, like we did in Stockton with Golden State Lumber, we have excellent partners like Andrew Lucero who and Sammy Nunez, who run fathers and families, who are in the community every day and training our, teaching our Straight A Guide program, our financial literacy program, helping those released from prison develop values and skills that employers value and documenting it through their weekly courses and our weekly courses and classes, collecting the evidence beyond just creating a resume or being able to give a two-minute elevator pitch on why you'd be a value to an employer, actively collecting evidence, not just saying what your values are, expressing how you're living faithfully to those values. Just don't tell me what your aspirations are. How are you pursuing them daily? So we collect that evidence. And once they've completed the program, they then qualify to to be placed with an employer and those that excel and shine are given the opportunity to convert to full-time employment. So like anything else in life, look at your position at Mark Life. It's through, it's through hard work, deliberateness every day, and evidence of success. We expect no different of those in our Straight A Guide program, and we reward them with employment and then seek to get them employed full-time. They have truly earned it. There are no handouts, and um, we're very proud of it. Justin, I've got just a couple more questions for you. But first, I need to take a minute to tell everyone about our sponsors at Health Excellence Select. Because I don't know about you guys, but I became fed up with my Obamacare insurance. My premium skyrocketed, my deductible skyrocketed, and I was forced to purchase a product that did not match my needs. But luckily, there is an alternative with health sharing. And our friends at Health Excellence Select have put together an amazing package to help you navigate the healthcare system. They'll enroll you in a health sharing plan, help you find doctors, get you 24-7 phone access to certified physicians, and get you all the discounts you need to help you become a self-pay, self-sufficient patient. And the best part, for most people, plans with Health Excellence Select are much more affordable than Obamacare insurance and are compliant with federal Affordable Care Act mandates, so you will not be fined for using it in lieu of your normal insurance. You really have nothing to lose, folks, by looking into Health Excellence Select. For more, head on over to lionsofliberty.com slash health. You will not regret it. 
Well, Justin, I'm glad you're doing this work. Uh, the issue of felons, the, the plight of felons, uh, is a phrase that we use here at uh, Lions of Liberty. It, we have a, one of our contributors, John Oderman, he writes a weekly column, Felony Friday, and uh, we do a monthly podcast, The Felony Report, where we focus on felons, but not, not as much always on the actual felony committed, but upon how that felony label really affects people in life. And it, obviously getting a job is one of those the biggest ways that somebody can be hurt by that felon label. And it, I'm so glad there's an organization like the Michael G. Santos Foundation and people like yourself and Michael Santos that are out there helping people at least get over that hump. Uh, what are some of the other challenges you see that the prisoners face upon reentering society other than just simply getting a new job? Well, you look at the barriers that are put up for people who have records, whether it's qualifying for, for welfare or being able to obtain a license, to, a professional license. I joke that many fel- as a felon, you can't even cut hair because you're not allowed to hold scissors. Part of the problem is a prison term isn't just the sentence. It's truly lifelong. And coming home um, broke with very few resources makes it very difficult to overcome the stigma or you begin working in a wage that doesn't pay you enough and it's very easy to revert back to crime. So the the opportunities that those who have been to prison have are, are, are limited. And while I'd love to be able to solve them all, we're a smaller organization. We're tackling the financial literacy, the cognitive training, and the employment aspect. From there, we can leverage off and work with other partners who can deal with, with other issues that are so pervasive. We're doing some work in California on Prop 47 that will drop felonies to misdemeanors you know, for so many. And just imagine getting that felony off your record, some real reform that has been passed by my colleagues who worked tirelessly to make this happen, working to get that felony uh, dropped to then have a misdemeanor. It then opens you up to a whole new pool of of the employment market. In fact, I think Michael's going to begin to do some really interesting podcasts on 47 and interview those who are for it, those who are against it. But for those who can have that felony dropped to a misdemeanor due to some, you know, significant change, in these laws will have a huge impact on some of the obstacles that that felons face. So I teach everyone in prison, even the white collar offenders with whom I work through my consulting, prison at times can be the easiest part of the sanction. It's clearly defined with a beginning and an end. Without preparations, without a skill set and a network, you'll endure this sentence for the rest of your life and it can turn out to be a life sentence. And I wish that on no one. So whether it's through the Michael G. Santos Foundation or through my consulting at federalprisonadvice.com, The onus is on us to prepare and seize every opportunity and release differently than the data suggests for for so many of us. Justin, I want you to just to imagine for a second that somehow, some way, you are made dictator for a day and you have the ability to make one reform to the criminal justice system. What would that reform be? That we could earn freedom, that prisoners who talk about changing their life, who are rewarded for for changing their life and someone like Michael Santos who worked tirelessly for 26 years to prepare for his release isn't viewed the same way as someone who watched the Kardashians all day on TV or played backgammon or table games. That you can earn your way home and prove worthy of a second chance through your own efforts, not through the calendar pages turning. Justin, those are great last words. I do appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your story with us, as well as sharing the information about what you're doing with the Michael G. Santos Foundation, the great work you're doing helping prisoners re-enter society. Before I let you go, would you just like to go through a quick run-through of how people can get in touch with the Michael G. Santos Foundation, where they can find your work, and how they can get in contact with you? I'd be happy to. So anyone who has interest in learning more about the foundation, including employers who might be willing to hire the formerly incarcerated on our payroll or directly on their own, may visit www.michaelsantos.org, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-S-A-N-T-O-S dot O-R-G. And of course, call me directly. Like many, I'm glued to my iPhone, 818-424-2220. I'd be happy to tell you about the great work we're doing to reduce violence and create safer communities and create pathways for those who have had uh, lives of struggle. Justin Paperni, thank you once again for coming on the show and keep up the great work. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Take care, Justin. Guys, that's the sound of me clapping for my guest, Justin Paperni, and the great work that he is doing helping people transition into and out of prison because the United States has the largest prison population in the world, not just by the numbers, but per capita as well. This is the land of the free, and there's something wrong with that. But in the meantime, while we try to figure that out and we we try to change our legal system, we have people like Justin Paperni, like past guest Michael Santos from episode 93, who are helping people that find themselves in this system for one way or another many people committed 
actual crime, such as Justin Paperni, who absolutely did commit a crime and should have been punished in some way. Now, I don't know if 18 months in prison is the way to punish him. Uh, to me, punishment should be more about getting retribution for the victims or preventing violent people from committing violence on others. In this case, Justin Paperni wasn't a violent individual. He was someone who did actively engage in fraud, and for that, he should absolutely have faced some sort of retribution, but who's to say that 18 months in a prison is that retribution? Who's to say it's not five years? Who's to say it's not three days? I don't know, because in our current system, there's no measurable way to determine if someone is actually improving their lives, if someone is actually paying retribution, paying their debts to society, becoming a better person, becoming someone worthy of earning their freedom. But in the meantime, the silver lining to this huge prison population, to the fact that so many people are felons out there, is that there is a market for people to help these individuals. There is an absolute robust market of felons out there that need help in life. So it's great that Justin Paperni was able to start the Michael G. Santos Foundation and actively help these people return to society and become better people and become productive members of society helping them get jobs, helping them make sure they don't fall back into any criminal habits that might have landed them in prison in the first place. It's an absolutely commendable thing that people like Justin Perperny and Michael Santos are doing. I encourage you to check out their work. I will link to everything in the show notes for this show, lionsofliberty.com slash 105, where you can find everything we talked about today. Uh, of course, there are so many ways you can come and interact with us. Let us know how you feel about the show. Let us know how you feel about your guests. Suggest guests to me. Suggest questions for my guests, you can do that by hooking up with us at our social media, facebook.com slash Lions of Liberty, over on the old Twitter, at Lions of Liberty. You can email me directly, mark, M-A-R-C, at lionsofliberty.com. You can even join up with our Facebook forum and interact with us over there. We'll, again, we'll link to that in the show notes at lionsofliberty.com slash 105. And until next time, folks, so long as you don't find yourself in prison, go ahead and live long! And even if you do, live free! Head of Editing and Mastering is John Dawson.